Hella black. New day, new fits. And we back with this video content. Back. My co-host is back. You know, he was putting up a petition about how he doesn't want to be on the video no That's more. That's not what, well, okay, I was going to say, I thought he said I want to be on the show anymore. I'm sorry. Video. Yeah, the video. That, was, that, that is fact. I didn't <laughs> say those words. The fact that a petition was uh, uh, rejected by the uh, Supreme Council of Hell Black Podcast. They vetoed it. <laughs> Got abstained. <laughs> so we back. You know, shout out to all the patrons, been supporting. Appreciate y'all, you know what I'm saying? Appreciate all the support. Everybody tapping in on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, yeah. wherever you get your podcast at. Keep ta- keep tapping in with us at Hello Black. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to everybody who's subscribing on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? It's another YouTube episode coming for y'all. So be sure to hit that little subscribe button and, you know, come rock with the real. This is New African Media. You know what I'm saying? Coming to you live and direct. Did you already say patreon.com backslash hello black <sighs> Well, you just did, my oh, brother. So sure. here we go. Support us. <laughs> like and subscribe on YouTube. We're trying to really build this channel out to the best of our ability. But we are not in a position where our YouTube is monetized, unfortunately. But, um, you know, through y'all's help, we can get there. So like, subscribe, comment on our YouTube so we can help get that traffic up. And as always, spread the politics. If you don't do one thing, if you don't do any of that, just be a vessel of truth and take the truth that you learn from this show and spread it to others. I think that's a fair compromise. Okay, nigga, at least get a follow on Instagram or something. <laughs> <laughs> a little something. <laughs> also, tap into episodes 148 and 149. Yeah, 149 was on YouTube, so be sure to tap in with that mm-hmm. episode. Great episode where we talked about uh, the so-called Zionist regime of Israel. We talked about <clears throat> what Zionism is, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of good content. You know, we've been uh, doing a lot of content recently. You know what I'm saying? So make sure you tap in with all that content. Re-listen to it. You know what I'm saying? You might get a new understanding each time you listen to it. So appreciate everybody. You know, we got to raise this consciousness, you know, uh, because consciousness, you know, it predates our action. So if we, as a conscious people, aware of our condition, we just taking every moment, every second uh, of the day and and realizing how can we put our best foot forward in the name of humanity. Uh, in the name of ending oppression, in the name of ending Euro-American control, you know, because if we all care about love like we all be saying we do, <laughs> we should uh, love ourselves, and that love for ourselves should be turned into a love for people, a love for humanity. Yep, and so our last two episodes have uh, been focused more on the international terrain, which um, you have to connect them, right, even though this is going to be, I guess, more of a domestic, a quote-unquote domestic analysis, Um what happens internationally impacts what happened here and what happens here uh, ultimately impacts what happens internationally, especially as we talk about uh, the president, the presidential election. Uh, we understand that whoever uh, becomes the next president of the United States is nothing more than a front runner investor, uh, a front runner and vessel for Western capitalist military domination, which can be summed up into the term imperialism. So I don't care if it's Joe Biden. I don't care if it's Donald Trump. I don't care if it's someone from the Green Party. I don't care if it's someone from the Socialist Party. Whoever governs this nation. will be an imperialist, a war criminal, and a genocidal terrorist. Because that person is still subject to On what? the first second of being in office. Still subject to NATO, to IMF, to the World Bank. To the Constitution of the United States of America. Period. Same the laws I made up. So let's talk about that, right? There are folks uh, that said, well, continue to say, to get Joe Biden elected uh, is the lesser of two evils. What does that mean now? As the lesser of two evils just put together another $3.7 billion package for the unjust, unjust state of Israel. I don't know how you can fix your lips to tell somebody to go vote for Joe Biden after Joe Biden has literally just militarily and economically, like he's been doing his whole career, Mm -hmm. backed Israel and backed Israel's war on the Palestinian people. I don't know how you can tell somebody to vote for somebody uh, who was allowing for all these bombs, over 6,000 bombs that had been dropped on Palestinian people. And you're going to tell somebody to vote for Joe Biden? Voting for Joe Biden is voting for genocide. That is the fact of the matter. I agree. So... Evil is evil. Essentially, this is this is a America that has uh, two different parties that have uh, similar interests, 
of American nationalism or white American nationalism, of capitalism, of imperialism. They might defer on how to do it, uh, but they are united, right? So again, to be uh, an American president is to be a commander in chief of genocide. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, right? The Republicans listen to this, right? Oh man, yeah, you're talking about Joe Biden. No, I'm talking about y'all too. But to say that somehow it's the lesser of two evils, because that's what happened in 2020. Oh, we need to go vote. We need to vote and get uh, Trump out of office. Never Trump. But look what Joe Biden has done. He put more police in the streets. He's front of the military more. And he is uh, actively, actively supporting uh, and commanding uh, this genocide against Palestinians right now. Yep. You tell me that's less evil? For tell you to go to hell. <laughs> less evil for who? <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about here? So again, even on the right side, Trump, I'm not saying that, but you can't vote for evil. Both of them is evil. Evil is evil, and this has been made very clear. Very clear. So we got to uh, rid ourselves from this uh, European, Euro-American way of thinking that voting uh, for the lesser of two evils is something that we can do. That has just gone out the window now. We're on the verge of World War Three, and you want to tell me to vote for someone uh, who is putting this country on a path to World War Three, even though that you know this path predates him, right? But this is someone who is actively uh, a part of that genocide. Evil is evil. Every single president, like Amir, he, he's uh, Amir said, uh, every presidents do presidents shit. Every president of this country will be a genocidal terrorist, terrorist on day one. And that's the fact of the matter. You know, so this cannot be the same <laughs> strategy. Because if we even have a, a, a data analysis, look at what Biden did compared to Trump. Let's look at that. We'll just have a, a was let the facts present themselves. The facts of him giving more money to the police. The facts of him starting this Ukraine uh, proxy war in Russia. The mm-hmm. facts of him uh, green lighting uh, Israel, Israel's genocide on the Palestinians. This has all happened yeah. within the past four years. Right? So no. <laughs> we can't make that same... I won't say we made the same mistake. I mean, we made the mistake in letting it happen because of our lack of organization, mm-hmm. uh, our lack of cadres being established, our lack of... Uh, Uh, fronts being established to actually uh, contest Euro-American control over our day-to-day lives. But to simply say this is a lesser of two evils and we just got to vote our way out of this and that uh, uh, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party is somehow less evil, get out of here. I feel you. Leave. (laughs) Leave. But I think something that's been interesting, you know, uh, when we first started the episode, you was talking a bit about you know, the Green Party and whoever is running for the president yeah. of the United States of America. You know, Cornell West, you know, have, as we've said, has been a Zionist. It's something that we pointed to uh, for a bit now, right? Uh, and he, you know, with this on- ongoing Israeli uh, Zionist aggression on the people of Palestine, you know, he's came out as a full-fledged uh, supporter of Zionism. Like, he, he, he has taken even the little camouflage things that he would try to do here and there that might camouflage his actions. Uh, he's came out as a, a, a full-fledged supporter, right? Uh, so why, I don't know, why do you think people uplifted him? Why did you? Why do you think people aligned with him, you know, or, and, and got behind his campaign and have been getting by his campaign and are still behind his campaign? I have a few thoughts on it. I would say the first thing I want to get at is the thing that I think people might try to, combat uh, Cornel West as not being a Zionist is his take on uh, a two-state solution, a uh, two-state resolution. I've come to understand two states, two-state resolution is Zionism. Israel has no right to exist. A Jewish settler colonial genocidal project dominated by Eastern Europeans, supported by the Western world, has no right or merit. Um, and if you want to know more about that analysis, again, take heed to... Uh, Episodes 148 and 149. So anytime somebody's saying, oh, they can, they can exist peacefully, no. The Eastern European Jews should go back to Eastern Europe. Palestine should be freed and be given uh, reparations, as we come to understand reparations as new Africans, right? Uh, the establishment of industries, 
the releasing of all Palestinian uh, political prisoners and prisoners of war, uh, actual money, the establishment of the Palestinian state, nation state, and all the institutions and uh, international recognition that that comes with, like an actual, um, for now, uh, recognition by the United Nations. Because the Palest- Palestine has, a, I think, like an observer or uh, they have like an observer. They don't have a, they don't, they're not, a, they're not actually recognized as a state by the United Nations. And so I think these are all things that need to come in terms of reparations. And so this is what I understand as freedom. I don't think a two state uh, solution isn't a sol- solution at all. I think it's a, a fascist tactic, right? That's, that's how I come to understand it. But to your point around why do people prop them up, specifically folks on the quote unquote left? Um, I would say either naivety, but so many people who claim to be dialectical, historical materialists and students of history and masters of the science of uh, the advancing of society and, and, econo- and the economic systems in the subsequent institutions, I don't know how a group could be so naive. Uh, so I would have to chunk it up to uh, them, I wouldn't say falling victim, more so taking advantage of the legitimacy that can be found through the illegitimate system of capitalism, right? Um, there's something about engaging with reactionary elements that gives your platform more rank. And it really is nasty work. <laughs> you know, like when you really sit nasty down and think, work going it is, on here, like my, my nigga Jazz say, it's, it's, really, it's nasty, it's nasty work. things. <laughs> <laughs> it's nasty work. And Darius uh, says, very strange. It's just, there you go, strange, <laughs> strange and nasty. Shout out to Darius and Jazz, man. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really wicked things. And again, I think at times I'm like, damn, are these people naive? But again, these are folks who claim to be students of history and masters of the science and clearly understand economic and societal development. Uh, and I think that it is them trying to take advantage of this moment um, and position themselves for careers and or seats at the table. I think what we're seeing right now, based off the presidential election and the height of the Palestinian resistance, that is giving uh, a new uh, light to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think what we're seeing now is the veil of neoliberalism uh, being removed off so many folks who are able to uh, present themselves as supporters of decolonization uh, through their takes on AFRICOM uh, and also their takes on uh, domestic resistance via the 2020 uprisings. So I think now you start to see who these people really are. I will, I will, I will never, I don't see any reason for us to put Cornell Wells on here and allow him to, uh, my dear brother, to speak, his, to speak his platform and never like really challenge it. You feel me? Like to really poke holes and, and stay what we say right now. Like, Hey, you a Zionist. Mm-hmm. You was like, I, you a Zionist. A two state resolution mm-hmm. is, is, is a fascist Zionist effort. Mm. Right, I, I don't see no no platform doing it. I think they're bringing oh, him on for his, views. His uh, Christian theology plays into the role. You feel me? I see. I see him being used as a method of views and to have a relationship so that because his platform will be bigger. Post this. That's a fact. These platforms that bring him on, uh, they have been legitimized through the illegitimate uh, Zionists. Mm. You feel me? And that's what I mean. Like black people see Cornell West on different black platforms and are going to say, "This is where I should be getting my news from." If because we know what. Capitalism's whole thing is celebrity. Mm. Whole thing is so if celebrity comes onto your platform, it must be real. It must be true. Then you partner that with uh, these folks and their different, uh, let's say, organizing legacies or their different uh, s- statuses in the academic arena. Like these people are having a full pronged approach to really position themselves as the next, you know, what I would say, opportunists and careers uh, under the under the guise of uh, being a revolutionary of being. Uh, you know, uh, pushers of decolonization. So, really nasty work that we watching. But you, like Carmen Terre said, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And a lot of y'all gonna have to be hiding behind these Zionists because you're not gonna be able to in a, uh, infiltrate the revolutionary New African community. Because we said what well, on the last episode, rep- repression raises consciousness. And when they the people see what's exactly going, see what's on. going people on, see all the dots put together. You feel me? The people very easily are going to know who is on the side of independence and who is on the side of integration. There's only two sides. You either free, you ain't. <laughs> mm-hmm. You either a slave or you free. And we're trying to be on the free side. Yeah, man. So I think, you know, thinking about this election and definitely how, you know, even people who 
say to be socialist, uh, legitimize elections in some way, right? So yeah, yeah. it's, you know, people like Cornell West running for president. Yeah. But then you have socialists running for president. Uh, how does this justify these bourgeoisie elections of the presidential office of the United Snakes of America? I mean, it legitimizes it. Period. <laughs> <laughs> it's an attempt. To me, it's an attempt to to legitimize it. Right? If socialism is supposed to be directly opposed to capitalism, I think a socialist organization uh, putting into putting energy uh, into an illegitimate capitalist process like the electoral college just doesn't make much sense to me. Right? The time, power, money that could be spent building real alternatives. Uh, Putting together a campaign that is guaranteed to lose is just wild to me. Like, you know, they're, you're, you're going to lose. Period. Right? Even in more, let's say, quote unquote, progressive nations like Russia, uh, the Communist Party is the second largest party, and that nation is still governed by capitalists and conservatives. This, the socialist organizations won't be done but a drop in the bucket. They won't, they won't be nothing but a drop in a drop in a bucket. And I've we've said before on our past, like uh, our past episodes that analyze elections, electoral processes, right? Uh, the crumbs of neoliberalism will happen regardless. So-called revolutionaries don't have to give that our energy. You're going to get the concessions. They have to get the concessions because of neoliberals, because of folks who push civil and human rights, but actually don't mind uh, capitalism, because of liberals who push civil and human rights, but don't mind capitalism. This is going to happen. You don't need to, the, the, you don't need to put your money in that. You don't need to put your time and money into this. And I think the socialists that learned before, all the ones that was called so-called socialists pushing Bernie Sanders. If Bernie Sanders couldn't win, you think they finna put... That's wild. Maybe they will put, I was gonna say, maybe they will put them in for uh, like, you know, representation purposes to be another, but like, Nigga, no. It's, Bernie it's, Sanders, you know, it's, it's not going We'd down be like that. Telling y'all he'd be a Zionist. He went full fledged. So again, these socialists who are supposed <laughs> and to again, coming out similar camps. That's the thing, too. you know. But these socialists again who are supposed to understand history. Mm. Why would you spend your time doing this? And again, like Cornell's campaign is going to get millions of dollars. This is money that could be going into building houses. This is money that could be going into providing free health care. This is this is money that could be going. Uh, to actually building sustainable programs to where you know all these dialectical historical materialists know that you need programs to engage in protracted struggle. So now you finna funnel millions of dollars into this uh, this process that for the most part is either, there's two options, right? I see either you say that you come out and you state again how illegitimate this is, which you should have known it was, or you go out and you back Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. It's the only like there has to, we have to have a different way of thinking. But like don't, you feel me? I feel like that's the only like what what comes of this? We know they're not going to win. So yeah. they say like oh this was illegitimate. You should have been new. You should have been new. Like you, you just maybe use the you Leninist. Like you could use you this point new. this whole time. Yeah, illegitimate election. So we're not going to build towards elections because that is doing what saying that this election actually has some type of Come merit on, dog. instead of. Like you're saying, spending all this money doing these campaigns, spending all these money on these uh, social media strategies, on these marketing Millions strategies. of dollars are going and into Let's this, be real. Bro. That's what's happening. But what Millions about that money was actually invested into community? And then now how do we as raise the consciousness of the masses, of the people, you know what I'm saying, who might even have good intentions, but how do we raise the consciousness to a level to where they say, no, we is going to hold these people accountable and say, no, we don't want you doing this no more. Why are you doing this? Why are you a, a, a so-called socialist organization doing this? Why are you saying, oh, okay, we're progressive and you're doing it, or whatever that even means? We know why, actually, right? But why are you doing this? But when the people rise up and say, no, we want, these, we want this money to go to the people. We want this money to go to the community. I mean, if you're if you claiming socialism. I only see it going two ways, brother. Claiming the illegitimacy of the electoral process, which we all been new. Or saying, ah, oh, we put up a good fight, y'all. Our best next option is Joe Biden. And that's what the left has, the so-called left, has done historically. Mm -hmm. Every four years, they show their ass. I mean, because you're still getting people involved into thinking about voting. 
even if you don't necessarily go out there and say just vote for Joe Biden, you have led a campaign talking about you votes. You have legitimized the you electoral legit- process. You have legitimated the process of voting for what? A settler colony. What's we for what? A genocidal colony. What you have done, what they have done is alluded to the chance of democracy. <laughs> and we need to talk about that. So we've talked about this a little. Let's let's really get into it. We talked about what's actually needed, which is some community power, community programs. So how do we actually build community power? And what is true democracy? Yeah. Power is only going to be built when the masses of people's consciousness is raised uh, from one state of being to another state of being. Right. When I was trying to get at earlier. okay, if we see this happening and the people see this as happening, the people have the power to be able to say no. On a small level, mm-hmm. on a small form, right, mm-hmm. uh, of organization doing all these things and, and spending millions behind this, millions of uh, on, on, uh, on a campaign, people have the power to say no. But that's going to take a, a mass consciousness, a mass awakening mm-hmm. uh, out of this prison of a mindset that says I have to vote every four years and or every two years or whatever, whenever the elections are, you know what I'm saying, whether it's local. But we got to be able to... Uh, uplift and shift people's consciousness to say that voting is the very like what is voting for a system of uh, which allows a president to get elected through electoral college when you don't even have the choice what does that mean but we have to change the way people think to seeing okay no my day-to-day actions my day-to-day movement in the community is actually a part of building quote-unquote democracy my uh, day-to-day engagement with people around me uh my day-to-day uh, discussions with people, my day to day, uh, implementing changes locally in my community, uh, getting the people on board with that. You know what I'm saying? So like true power is going to come through the development of revolutionary organization. True power is going to come through the development of revolutionary programs that meet, meet the needs of the people that put the people into positions of power, uh, through organizing around their needs, through meeting those needs, and then uh, galvanizing that power that is developed through that organizing, and then using that as an offensive to move uh, forward towards actual meaningful change. But ultimately, if we understand that this United States government is a settler colony, and that international law uh, forbids settler colonies, ultimately it should lead us toward the offensive of what? Decolonization. Right? So true democracy is actually a people's government, Mm -hmm. a people's government that is uh, guided by uh, communal and egalitarian practices where the will of the masses of the people uh, is put into priority, where day to day people is taken care of, day to day communities is taken care of, day to day uh, neighborhoods is taken care of, right? From free housing, free health care, right? And these ain't just like, uh, me, buzzwords of uh, you know, this is like real tangible things that we could touch, see, feel, and benefit from. You know, people talk all the time about holistic health. <laughs> uh, true democracy is the whole uh, holistic health of a people. It's the will of people. It's the will of humanity uh, for the good of humanity, and not for the detriment. That is a a capitalist system that always puts us in. Uh, systems of hyper co- uh, hyper competition, yeah. uh, hyper individualism. You know, the Demo- like power to the people. That's true democracy. Yeah, where the people get to actually make the decisions, where the people actually get to make the laws. Because why are we still governed by laws that were written by white slave holding men that literally had uh, teeth of the enslaved Africans within their mouth? And this is the law that is governing our day to day, our day to day life in twenty twenty three. Yep. But that's why we can't legitimize these elections. Yep. Each, you know, George talks about each uh, election we legitimize makes freedom further and further away. All right. So we got to build these programs for decolonization. Yep. <laughs> get off the pulpit, get off the get off the podcast. <laughs> you might have to get on the pulpit and be on the podcast. But don't forget about the program, Build the program in the community, because that's the heartbeat and the lifeline to the community to where the community can begin to organize uh, for its own material needs and make the own decisions that it needs to to benefit. Yeah. And that's what we got to do. Because I mean, these elections ain't solving it clearly. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head, right, where you talk about um understanding right uh well which i would 
call it like knowledge, right? Which comes through uh, political education, which how can the people actively participate in decision making if they don't fully understand the institutions and processes that govern their lives? Most most people don't actually understand uh, the three branches of government. They actually we don't actually understand these things. You feel me? Like we just go and fill up fill out a ballot. Is that true democracy? If you don't understand, and then I think the next point you talk to is experience that can only be gained from a programmatic level, right? The reason why these folks, like these people, have a clear trajectory. They go from running certain businesses to governors, mayors, like there's like a trajectory. How do you plan to govern an entire nation when you have no, you don't control any institutions, resources, or power in your community? Like really? So you're supposed to go from doing nothing but, you know, doing your your podcast, your books, whatever, whatever. You, you're supposed to go from most of these folks are nothing but cultural critics. They aren't actually like politicians, not even on a small scale. Like, critics is a, you ain't you ain't politicking. You feel me? Like you can't actually go out. Like you don't go out into your community and politic. And now you're supposed to represent millions of people. You're supposed to govern an entire nation. You don't even make decisions for communities. You have no real power. You don't know what it is to politic. And so I think that any person who goes from being a think that can be a very small scale community organizer at best to the president of the United States with some of these socialist party candidates folks running like. It just don't make much sense to me. Or if yo, now you're supposed to be the cabinet, this the socialist group, and y'all have no programs, y'all have done nothing to feed thousands of people, y'all have done nothing to clothe thousands of people, y'all have done nothing to feed and educate and clothe hundreds of thousands of and people, y'all have, done no, clinic. y'all have done no community restoration projects, and now you're supposed to govern a nation, like, let's get our heads from up out of our asses. You know what I'm saying? Let's just be See real. the light of day. <laughs> Again, you named it for me, bro, I feel the same way. Knowledge yeah. and experience, in my opinions, are my, in my opinion, are non-negotiables. Uh, for true de- for true democracy, yeah. right? That's this is how I see it, and those can be formed through constant, consistent political action, education, <laughs> and action. <laughs> Tell us y'all you thoughts. Know. Maybe y'all don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> Something though, you know, following up for from uh, episode one forty nine to some degree, right? We discussed it uh, a little bit there, uh, but just thinking about how uh, you know this so called governor of uh, what they call the Republic of California sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The so-called governor of the state of California, Gov- Governor Newsom, you know, he went to uh, the Zionist land of Israel, you know, the Zionist is- uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine, uh, and then right after he went to China, right? So this is Governor Newsom going to Israel and then going to China, uh, governor of California. So uh, I don't know. What, what do you think this means uh, in the geopolitical realm, and then also in the you know the local American state politics and and nation politics. I don't know. I think this is an interesting yeah. uh, development potentially from the De- Democratic Party. I mean, I think if you know the role that California plays in the national GDP, it makes complete sense why while the chief representative of this state would be traveling to Israel. Um, when you also recognize that within the next few years he will be running for president, it makes complete sense. He has to develop specific relationships uh, so that he can position himself as there won't be any shift in this. You should know that I'm going to come in here and do the same exact thing. I'm going to push forward Zionism. I'm going to push forward imperialism. Uh, and so that's what I think is hidden just uh, running an early campaign and further laying the foundations for any type of uh, adjustments that need to be made for imperialism mm-hmm. to take its next steps. Um, yeah, I, I see it as both a political and a publicity thing, um, which will have like material uh, results, of course. I'm, uh, I know that the visit to China has to do with some sort of... Um, international finance capital but i'm i'm curious to see like what actually comes from it you know um like is it a technology thing uh what natural resources is california going to be able to contribute uh, or what natural resources is california looking to get from uh china and how well yeah what's the national impact but I, again if i think to sum it up i think it's him starting play the early foundations for his presidential campaign uh, through stating very clearly, like, this is my policy that I'm pushing forward. 
and just starting to develop those or further develop those relationships. Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, we'll see what happens, you know, even in terms of uh, Biden's ability. <laughs> but I think they're for sure. Newsom is on that track. He's definitely on that track. I would also say it's uh, interesting, you know, California and Israel, uh, if we look at what they produce and export uh, to the world, uh, it's technology. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We talk about Silicon Valley and, you know, Israel as well being very deeply tied to Silicon Valley as well as their own technology that is built in the Zionist land <laughs> of Israel. So I think that was uh, what deals are being made. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Sure. What deals are being made, what infrastructure, what cybersecurity, uh, what uh, technological deals is, is being uh, forged in this very moment. And I thought it was very interesting, too, that he went from Israel to China. You know, uh, China is very big in terms of green capitalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> California is very big in terms of green capitalism, uh, especially as it comes to quote-unquote climate change, right? Uh, I said quote-unquote because of... Uh, uh, the capitalist exploitation of new markets that are being developed, right? So it's like, it seems like deals is being made <laughs> and positioning him to be this international leader, uh, especially in times of growing, growing tension between the United States and China. It's interesting that they send Newsom over there to discuss money. Yeah. You know, like these, they're making business deals right in front of our face. They is playing with us. Yeah. That's why I say, well, okay, with bricks, but what's really happening with bricks? When these people were still cutting deals, you know what, what I'm saying? Bricks when you still what is good with at Israel? bricks when you're trading with Israel? What is good with bricks when someone who just left Israel was on some type of mission to Israel and then you let him into your country? What's really happening? <laughs> what's really happening? How is he being positioned? Capital drives everything, man. What it come down to for some for most of these people, mm -hmm. capital, know. capitalism. So hello black. Hope you enjoyed this uh, this uh, this show we have for y'all. Quick little show, but we talk that talk.